Russ Tronsted um, is at the University of uh, Arizona and uh, is an outreach professor and extension specialist in the Department of Agriculture and Resource Economics. He was raised on a ranch in rural Montana and from uh, working with Russ, is, uh, it's, it's, he is, it is true, you can take the man out of Montana, but you can't take Montana out of the man. So, uh, and we're pleased about that. Some of us have a special place in our heart for Montana. But he was on a cattle and green uh, ranch that had both irrigated and dry land air, uh, acreage. And, and Russ's excellence has been recognized. Uh, he's received a number of awards. Uh, and is presently uh, sp uh, specializing and uh, working with uh, small-scale specialty producers, uh, both commercial and small-scale uh, in that area. His curriculums he's developed, uh, Western Profiles of inno Innovative Agriculture Markets, uh, examples of direct marketing and agritourism enterprises, so he's well qualified uh, this morning to talk to us. So Russ, it's yours. Thank you, John. Uh, it's a, a pleasure to be here, and I just uh, hope that I can uh, keep everyone engaged here. It's hard to imagine what everybody's looking at and what everybody's doing out there without an audience here, but I can tell by the attendee list that there's uh, Obviously, a lot of people there that are very qualified to also talk on this subject, and I'm sure I could learn a lot from everybody in the audience as well. But uh, just to give a little outline of some things I plan to go over here uh, this morning or afternoon, wherever you may be, but um, just to talk a little bit about you know niche versus commodity marketing. I know uh, yesterday, uh, Ed and Dylan, a lot of the things that uh, they were talking about in terms of marketing had to do with you know somewhat of uh, forward pricing kind of timing the market um, you know not necessarily uh, hoping for that the high price of the year but having a plan to to market at a, at a good seasonal price uh, whereas some of the niche marketing here that we'll look at is uh, somewhat of a different strategy in the sense that we're trying to to differentiate the products so that we're able to get a different price than the same thing that's going on with the commodity market. Obviously, uh, third-party certification is uh, a part of that in terms of uh, uh, verifying to consumers that, that you don't know, you know how, how your product is grown and what the attributes of your products are. Uh, organic being one of the more common uh, third-party certification things. We'll look at that some. We'll look at some of the direct marketing uh, trends that have been going on for uh, agriculture and producers. And then I'm going to pull up a couple of producer examples here from some producers in southeastern Arizona. Uh, just tell some of their story a little bit in terms of how they they view their niche and, and the way they're approaching uh, their marketing and just talk about some resources that are available for us as we look in this area of niche marketing. Well, I guess to start here, in terms of niche marketing, uh, what, do we, what do we kind of mean? I guess, I guess yeah, I like to think of person, person that I like product service combination, combination is you may be different, different, different from what mainstream uh, providers, providers or others are providing. Or others are providing. Uh, uh, you, you know, you might be more than organic, organic apple, apple, at least at one point, point, point being somewhat as a niche there. there. As, as we know, it's growing so, so the niche might be disappearing. You know, and then you find that niche by saying, well, you had a big operation where you also have a scandal. And so, so different things that you can do that, that make you unique from what uh, mainstream is doing. Um, also, in terms of their niche, I think is focusing on the target customers. Uh, you could have a geographic area, you know, a narrow geographic area within you know 50 miles of your place or something. Then, if you're targeting that group, uh, that gives you somewhat more of a niche than others, the rest of the competition around the the U.S. Um, the demographics within that area could be the ethnicity of the group. It might be even just uh, things of like, uh, you could be targeting even like say uh, children, uh, school school bus tours. I know uh, some people in the area have found that school bus tours are a good way to get started in, in terms of kind of doing uh, 
recreation and selling directly on your farm because you have good control of what what the audience is going to be uh, you know what you know how many are going to show up um, when you're starting into uh, the direct farm marketing uh, you open up the gates to your place you don't know how many people are going to show up necessarily and you might get overwhelmed so that's one way I think some people have gotten into kind of starting in on a smaller scale with some of the school bus tours so in essence here then you want kind of a, a combination of your uh, product service attributes and your customer profiles that is somewhat unique that defines uh, your market niche so within that I guess we look at what are some of the challenges here for this niche marketing approach and probably one of the first challenges would be just to find a market segment that is you know small enough that mainstream has kind of overlooked it but yet also large enough to be profitable if it's a, a real small uh, market I mean it's going to be hard for you to create enough volume and economies of size to you know make it viable for your business um, next I guess I think important to keep in mind with niche marketing is that the repeat customers are key for it because it's a small market you want to be sure you've got these target customers coming back to you so you want to pay attention to your repeat customers and also if you're in part of a growing market that that is helpful because it is a small market if the base is growing that's going to help you in terms of being successful with your niche marketing and probably one of the I think most important things to think of in terms of a niche market is uh, you know why have others not already taken advantage of your identified uh, niche market if you've found this what you think is going to be a new niche how come you know ask yourself how come somebody hasn't already gone out there and and taken advantage of this niche and that's where your uniqueness can fill in that that void and say I have certain certain attributes on my place that nobody else has whether they might be cost advantages or different locational advantages or even just your farm story with sometimes in terms of your uh, your heritage that is, belongs to your place that you can sell that nobody else can sell and and to kind of look at put this into a graphical perspective here I guess if we think of in terms of the two areas where ag is uh, growing we think of it being over here with where we have our large-scale commodity growers over here where we have a farm size that's very large and they're producing essentially a homogeneous product like commodity and this you know fits in with the area where uh, Dylan and Ed were talking about yesterday with some of the livestock marketing and uh, grain marketing this area is growing here these large producers also there tends to be growing in agriculture here in terms of the the smaller producers to mid-size that are that are producing a differentiated product here and be it uh, value-added activities or uh, tourism or different things that they provide with their product to differentiate themselves from the mainstream producers and I guess if we look at how people do get uh, sometimes set apart uh, if you don't know your consumer or and you're trying to reach out to a broad audience uh, labels third-party certified labels are uh, one way that that you can kind of reach out to these uh, consumers and set yourself apart from the competition uh, you can just uh, look here fair trade certified here that's a, a, a logo that you'll often see out in the in the grocery store whatnot on uh, how the uh, the product the is product being grown in a way so that it's been fair to labor, labor practices. practices. You can also you think, can also of, think in of in terms of being, of being uh, uh, friendly to friendly animals, to animals uh, uh, you know, with, you know, uh, with uh, the certified humane so that it's been raised in a way that's been uh, favorable to animal treatment. So these are these are attributes we would call credence attributes in the sense that you can't uh, verify this by looking at the product or actually uh, con consuming the product but uh, they can only be verified in terms of the production process so there and also you think of uh, our kosher labels and whatnot these are are things that are are gaining in popularity actually and not just so much for religious reasons but also for in terms of uh, food safety reasons in terms of believing that the process has gone through more scrutiny as it's uh, being 
being refined and processed. So these are these are one way that um, people have uh, used to to distinguish themselves uh, from the competition and certification. And we've got a a publication that we worked on with the I worked on with others in the Western Extension Marketing Committee here uh, called the Certification and Labeling Considerations for uh, Agricultural Producers. And one of the diagrams that I like in there in terms of in this publication is uh, Gene Kinsey's uh, Hierarchy of Consumers Food Preferences here. And just to, to note that as incomes have increased, there's a certain portion of individuals across the the U.S. in particular here, that have moved beyond just paying for convenience and affordable and whatnot, and they're actually willing to pay for things related to status and causes, which would be like animal animal welfare, uh, being uh, growing food that's better for the environment in some cases, uh, the argument given for organics. Uh, so in addition to just the health of, of the own individual, uh, there can be other attributes that are brought in there that people are, are willing to pay for and certification is a part of that. So I'll put this up as, as kind of a, a resource for further reading that you could look into in terms of looking at ways to uh, differentiate yourself and make a market niche. If we move on here to like uh, organics being one of the, the most popular programs, I guess, for third party certification and verification, if we look at here kind of the market penetration here of organics, from 1997 up through through last year 2008 you can see that organic in terms of dollars of food sales has gone from you know about 0.8 percent less than one percent up to around three and a half percent so organics uh, has been growing and it's still been growing at a, at a not as fast as it was um, in recent years but um, from the basic numbers I can find here we're still growing this is at a double digit rate here and even in spite of the you know kind of the downturn of the economy there, there is still uh, appears to be growth going on in terms of the organic market here and if we were to look at in terms of kind of the breakdown here in terms of uh, organic food sales you can see that the the fruit and vegetable categories here uh, the the green up here tends to be the the largest and uh, the, the green here is about you know roughly around 37 percent here in 2008 uh, next online we would have the our, our dairy here you know which is around about 16 percent and then uh, 13 percent here for uh, some of our packaged and prepared and breads and grains here being about uh, 10% and then on down here where you have about 5% and then meat just only around 3% or so but even though some of these categories are small down here there's a fair bit of evidence that they're growing uh, uh, quite a bit as well during this time so the other question is I guess you know what is the organic price premiums uh, you know these are things that I think you know vary a lot by product and by season and but when you're thinking of your market niche uh, what is it that you might be able to grow at a certain time period in a certain window where you can outcompete others in your area and maybe a broader scale as well is something to keep in mind. Uh, you can see from, uh, you can go to the Rodell Institute here and there's one site that has uh, some uh, information here on current organic prices and if we were to pull up and look at some of the things they might have here for like uh, fruit you can see this gives uh, a list of what they have in terms of uh, the certified here organic and then also the conventional and over here for vegetables certified and conventional and you can see the price premium varies quite a bit and even in some cases here like if we look down here towards uh, our green cabbage we can see that they have for the same weight here a uh, conventional a little bit higher price than certified so you know that's one of the risks to to growing organically is that you know you may not always get the that high price premium and I know some growers have said that they always you know wind up say, moving some of their organic into the conventional market just to move enough of the volume that they have so you might not necessarily count on getting a price premium for everything that's grown 
uh, organically. When we think of uh, our niche here through direct marketing, I guess uh, locavore probably comes to mind here. I guess this is kind of a new word that was out. I guess the the new Oxford American Dictionary had it as the word of the year here in 2007, but it's a, a term that kind of originated in the, the San Francisco Bay Area, but um, in terms of being a person that seeks out the locally produced food there, and uh, not only does it involve nutrition in terms of being better and, you know, locally for a better taste, but also kind of driven behind a locavore is someone who mi seeks to kind of like minimize the carbon footprint of the food that they consume so that they're um, minimizing kind of the impact here to the environment. The other thing I think of in terms of direct marketing is that there is also tends to be a really close uh, connection of the consumer with the grower. It's kind of filling the gap there in terms of having a consumer that goes down to the grocery store and just uh, picks their you know, product off the shelf and puts it in the grocery bag. They don't really have a connection with where it's grown or anything. And that kind of goes back to the, the customer intimacy approach in terms of uh, differentiating themselves with that consumer. Uh, also, I think uh, there's a lot of consumers that recognize that they, if they can support their local community environment and sometimes even the open space of the farm, that's something that they're, they're willing to help support. And even some consumers would say, you know, that they feel that they're, when they can look at that producer in the eye and see where their food's coming from, and know kind of the credibility of that grower that they feel better about their food than just going into the regular supermarket and thinking well this came from a factory farm or something and not knowing exactly what may be behind some of the, the safety issues of, of the food there. So when we look at direct farm marketing in terms of kind of trends where we've been going I just thought I'd pull up here the Ag Census definition and Basically, the Ag Census here defines in 2007, for their 2007 census, uh, did you produce, raise, or grow any crops, livestock, poultry, or ag products that were sold directly to individual consumers for human consumption? So you can see it includes the roadside stands, you know, pick your own door-to-door, -door, but it excludes things like, you know, processed items, it might be uh, jellies, jams, and hams. So in looking at what the value of their direct sales was, if we look at our um, Ag Census numbers here, we can see in terms of looking at all farms from um, 1997 here up through uh, 2007 over here, that all farms here have essentially been about flat. They've actually decreased just a little bit. But farms that have actually been doing direct marketing or selling some directly to consumers for final end consumption there, it's increased about 2% uh, annually here. So you can see they've grown from about 5% of uh, all farms that do direct marketing to upwards of around 6.2%. And we look at farm sales, we can see that, you know, all farm sales have increased, you know, just a little bit above inflation over this period from 1997 to 2007. But uh, direct farm marketing here sales have increased annually at, you know, over 7% here, uh, you know, above inflation and you can see just in terms of the the amount of sales it's still very small you know going from like 0.3 percent up to 0.41 percent of total sales that's still a small percentage but the growth is there so I mean I think this is uh, falls under the definition here what we would call a, a niche market here um, now I pull you to a couple examples here hopefully a little bit more interesting here that are over here in the corner here of southeastern Arizona here uh, to look at some of the things that they've been involved with in what I would call uh, some of the niche markets that, that they've worked on to develop. The first one here I'll look at is um, Apple Annie's Orchard here and they kind of have a, a an interesting story in the sense that when they look to get into uh, growing the apples in the the 80s, the mid 80s here, they thought, uh, you know, that they were going to, they apparently listened to the ag economists around and they thought that they were going to make so much money they're going to need a truck to haul all their money. But what actually happened is when they uh, took their apples, uh, sold them to the, the packing shed the first year, uh, the packing shed sent them a bill because the, the cost of the picking was more than the value of what they had for their apples. So 
and they reevaluate and say we got to do something differently here so they they got into the business of direct marketing not necessarily by choice but in some sense just by survival and as time went on um, they were, were growing their business with the, their orchard in terms of their apples and pears and whatnot they were marketing there was another farm uh, not too many miles away in the same area there that was also doing on the produce side a lot of uh, vegetables that he was marketing directly and when he put his farm up for sale they realized that they needed to keep that farm and going because they had a lot of complementary in this going and synergies between people coming out from the Tucson area going to you know this area to do some you pick and whatnot and they felt that if they didn't have this complementarity with their produce side that they were going to be at, at risk in terms of vulnerability for the growth of their operation so they went ahead and uh, bought that operation and you can see this is a, a sign at their uh, uh, produce farm there uh, Appalachian produce and pumpkins where they have both uh, you pick and uh, we pick so they have both both um, commodities there uh, available uh, that you can have and then they label things out in the field so that you know the consumers can have an idea exactly what they're picking and, and where they're at um, if you look at uh, just some of the experiences and things that they have there they've got uh, you know uh, apple barn they call and then it's right next to this area here where you can have picnic tables under their peach trees uh, they've got uh, you know kettle corn uh, homemade ice cream and uh, another thing they've added uh, recently was uh, a fudge kitchen one thing you, in listening to their story you find that they've kind of shifted their kitchen from uh, cider to actually fudge because of you know just the, the economics associated with the, the the situation they were making much on the cider and some of the other people they were in touch with across the country told them that fudge was a good gamble there a good thing to do so they got into to some of the fudge if you can believe it um, they also do several uh, value-added products here and this allows them I think to minimize some of the risk in terms of just always having things uh, ready there for the fresh I know uh, the while well, the you pick is a an important thing and they usually uh, always buy oftentimes their apples and things for their value-added products they um, do face certain risk though with the UPIC side in the sense of weather. I know one year they were pretty much rained out the week, the whole month of October on all the weekends, and that you know was something that they remembered for a long time. And uh, you know having some of these uh, value-added products allows them to get you know different things into some of the stores, and also uh, these are gift items in particular that a lot of people will buy locally for gifts for even Christmas time. A next farm here we'll take a look at it's just down the road actually a little bit and this is a uh, Briggs and Eggers orchard they have about a 400 acre orchard they're larger scale uh, larger size than the Apple Annie's orchard uh, they began uh, you know doing things uh, organically uh, in the about the 90s there and uh, one of the things that uh, they've had to work with in terms of being organically is develop a lot of the technology associated with uh, the apple codling moth they've been involved with uh, getting uh, things so that uh, mating disruption and a lot of that stuff they've, they've been kind of some of the pioneers in, in some of this area so that part of their niche just comes back in terms of their cost efficiencies and that comes back also I think in terms of their strategy to the future as well they um, you know really tout you know freshness as being something that they have that others do not have and of course they you know say getting getting that fruit in there within 48 hours is what they're after and that's um, you know their fruit does look good the other thing they do is they also um, market a lot of their product here with new harvest organics um, if you look here at this picture here this is a picture of uh, Briggs and Eggers orchard and uh, Mount Graham in the background and um, they have kind of po a real positive synergies here with their marketing outlet and their production but the other thing that I'd like to note is that they also have a fruit stand here on their place and they at this fruit stand here they also not only sell to people directly here but they also sell to what uh, Lance Higgers would call uh, some of their peddlers or people that 
to take their product to the farmers markets and locally and what's interesting about this is they say that in about 1995 he said they really didn't have hardly any market for this here they were just kind of getting started but today it's about 10 percent of their market and he's really glad in a sense because as Washington State's come on with a lot of organic apples and competition and stuff he said this market here this local market is something that's been some you know paid them held up well in terms of both the price and uh, volume and uh, something that they're interested in in growing with um, so I think you know when you think of uh, some of the niche marketing considerations I think you know these local the local consumer aspect in having a reliable market is something to keep in mind um, they can minimize some of the risks that you might face from some of the outside competition and in this case when you think of you know apples in southeastern Arizona they're not even on the map compared to Washington State so I mean he can compete effectively with them on the location cost efficiencies and good records I mean I think both of these operations are very much in terms of well aware of what their bottom line is for all of these operations and you know as uh, the organic competition increased there Lance would just say that they need to be organic and they're going to continue on that front because they have to differentiate their, their product and basically he's looking at ways that he can cut costs down to outcompete others people that are getting into organics Apple Annie's they essentially grow their apples organically except for the fact that in their orchard that people don't like weeds so they do spray roundup and otherwise if he, if he could find a way to economically control his weeds he said he would do certified organically but he just can't find a way that he can uh, do the the weed control as as effectively and then but he also markets directly and and consumers they know in terms of you know the pesti pesticides are not used and that's important for his customers the other thing I think is important to consider is the people skills here not only is it uh, people skills for dealing with labor because as you move away from commodity to more niche marketing I think you just can't do everything all your yourself you have to be able to have labor that you can manage and rely on also you have to be able to manage people on your farm in terms of people if you're doing any you pick or anything like that that's something very important to be able to do to assess your people skills as to whether this is something you can do because a lot of commodity marketers I don't think have the a personality to fit in with some of the direct marketing that goes on also just think of not only is your products being uh, complementary with each other and what's on your farm what kind of uh, things that is unique to your farm but also you know is it complementary with other producers in the area uh, and some of the things in the Western profiles we found was a lot of producers that were able to team up successfully with others with similar goals and whatnot were important. I know even one case here in there in Tucson, there's a direct marketer of beef teamed with another direct marketer of beef because they don't want to spend all their time at the farmers market and they have a similar philosophy. So that has worked together there. And this is something here that uh, John Newkirk here, or not John, but uh, uh, John Eichard as noted here in the sense that your uniqueness is the only source of kind of your profitability that cannot be competed away and it's just the sustainable part of having a niche market and I think that's a, a good piece of advice to keep in mind that uh, your uniqueness here is what you're really selling for the long term I just mentioned a few of these resources here uh, with the Western Extension Marketing Committee been involved with uh, niche markets here uh, the Western profiles and this uh, certification and labeling considerations if you go to valueaddedag.org uh, you can download these publications for free uh, there's also a lot of other uh, resources out there in terms of uh, if we look at uh, USDA they have quite a bit of data here on organics uh, there's the National Organic Program uh, a lot in terms of the standards there uh, ATRA here with the uh, NCAT they have a lot of resources here available here on organics the USDA process verified is a fairly new system here um, the never ever three applies to a lot of livestock products in particular but with no antibiotics or growth promotants or any animal byproducts that's something there uh, eat wild these are these bottom three here are kind of online sites for 
getting recognition from your site and recognition from some of the local consumers and with that that's that's everything I have and uh, look forward to uh, questions that may follow later Russ thank you don't go away we got a couple questions for you uh, while we uh, query uh, the audience um, and thank you for excellent information um, we, we've actually had a, a suggestion about the weed control issues uh, someone said for weed control they could apply some of the practice from and uh, binds and ovines uh, vineyard weed control project that uses sheep trained not to eat the grapevines and uh, actually the sheep have been trained using, using lithium chloride as for aversion uh, uh, training and uh, another uh, uh, participant uh, wanted you to uh, possibly distinguish between uh, uh, wholesale prices and they were making the point that wholesale prices are sale prices, uh, not necessarily the prices uh, paid to growers. Although you want to comment on that just a little, and then I've got one other question for you. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's true. I mean that they're not the price paid to growers, but I guess we'd hope that some of the premium there would also reflect back down to the grower. But it's true; it's not necessarily yeah. On the weed control side, I mean, I think it's you know it's possible. Yeah, you might might be able to do some things with uh, sheep and goats and whatnot. Uh, I know Iggers they uh, they do a lot of weed whackers basically for their their weed control. Um, you know, I guess the difficulty with uh, having uh, animals out there as well. Then you have another enterprise to try and manage, and uh, you know, not necessarily all the weeds. Or 100% are gone, so that's that's one of the difficulties trying to find a product that you can get, you know, 100% essentially 100% control. Yeah. One of our uh, audience asks, says third-party certification can be expensive for smallholders, in especially crops and organic. Uh, got any suggestions on how they can handle that obstacle? Yeah, I'd, I'd agree. And uh, but there is uh, the 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 program now being offered through uh, some of the departments of ag uh, for a cost share on reimbursement of organic certification. Um, usually, it's up to you know a cost share up to like fifty percent, up to I think it's like seven fifty now or something like that. And there is also some. Uh, Equip money is available in certain areas for transition to organic assistance. Although, you know, as to how how much people are going to actually be able to get out of that, that's supposedly up to you know like twenty thousand dollars or something over time or more than that. But uh, you know, I think the total amount one would realistically expect to get would be less than that. But you know, definitely, I mean, it's not necessarily like the the price premium there comes for free. I mean, you've got to be able to go through the certification process, and I think that's one of the things, you know, where Briggs and Eggers feel that they have a competitive advantage. They know they know how to do that. They they're they know where their costs are and where they can cut in order to still be uh, competitive uh, by meeting those requirements. Uh, questions keep flowing in for you Russ which we'll get to later uh, we're gonna gonna give you a chance to answer one last question here uh, and we'll get back to the other questions that folks are entering really thank you for doing that they're strong questions we'll come back to those but uh, I think you uh, referenced a Rodale site where the premium prices for organic, the comparison to premium uh, to organic and non-organic was put. Was that a Rodale site? Yeah. Uh, and I think if you just Google Rodale, R-O-D-A-L-E, it'll you can work your way to that site. Would that be the suggestion? The other thing is they can. Review your slide set, which is up on, on our Ag and Uncertain Times website as well. 
Uh, thanks, Russ. Uh, stick around. Uh, we'll have time for some other uh, questions. Uh,